The Herald Tribune Forums is broadcast on WNYC as scheduled. For the first in the new series of Lectures to the Laity, WNYC-FM takes you now to the New York Academy of Medicine. From the New York Academy of Medicine, your city station brings you the first in this, the 16th series of Lectures to the Laity. This opening lecture, the Lindsley R. Williams Memorial Lecture on Men, Machines, and the World About, is to be delivered by Dr. Norbert Wiener. To inaugurate this new series of lectures to the laity, we now introduce Dr. Benjamin P. Watson, president of the New York Academy of Medicine. Ladies and gentlemen, this evening we inaugurate the 1950-51 series of lectures to the laity. It was a happy thought on the part of the officers of the New York Academy of Medicine 16 years ago which led them to institute those lectures. Medicine had then long passed the stage when it was practiced empirically. The foundations of the scientific approach had been laid. The basic medical sciences had been well established and medicine was drawing more and more upon pure science for the elucidation of its problem. Science in many of its branches was being taught in our schools and our colleges, and so the public at large was becoming capable of understanding the nature and implications of scientific progress. It is with the idea of showing how scientific advance is furthering our knowledge of health and disease that these laity lectures are given. With each passing year, new knowledge has come and the Academy has tried to pass it on to you by inviting to address you scientists and clinicians who have the ability to explain in simple language the nature and results of their own researches and those of others in their field. In this year's series, you will have discussed in succeeding sessions what might be called this evening the mechanics of bodily functions, the subtle action of the endocrine organs, the intriguing subjects of psychology and psychiatry with their bearing on mental and bodily health, the action of the antibiotics, and the possibilities of still greater discoveries in this field. It is with such broad aspects of medical thought and progress that these lectures deal. In the most recent number of the New York of New York Medicine, which is the official publication of the Medical Society of the County of New York, there is an editorial on the scope and content of the present series of lectures to the laity, in which it is asked, what is a layman? And answering the question by stating, with much truth, that many of our doctors constitute what might be called the professional laity, and that they could profit greatly by attending those lectures. I place myself in this category. For even the most hard-working and studious of medical men cannot keep abreast with all that is going on in science as applied to medicine. I take this editorial as a great compliment to the members of the Special Committee of the Academy with Dr. Howard B. Kies as chairman and Dr. Iago Galston as secretary, who are responsible for choosing subjects and speakers. The Academy is also deeply grateful for the interest taken in those lectures by the uh, Board of Education, and particularly the, int the, particularly the interest taken by Dr. I.H. Goldberger in acquainting all the uh, staffs in that large department with these laity lectures. <coughs> Dr. Kyes, Dr. Galston have been uh, instrumental in uh, getting together this series of lectures, and I'm going to call on Dr. Kyes, Dr. Hal B. Kyes, to address you for a moment. Dr. Kyes. It's my privilege to introduce the chairman of the evening, 
And before I do that, I wish to do what is definitely done each year. You will notice that these are called the Lindsay R. Williams Memorial Lectures, and I wish to comment on that subject. For some years now, it has been our custom to, de to dedicate the first in the series of our annual laity lectures to the memory of Dr. William Lindsay R. Williams, the first director of the New York Academy of Medicine. It is more than fitting that we should do so, for he was a precious and a rare being, one who combined in his person the best qualities of the medical statesman and of the conscientious citizen. Devoted as he was to the advancement of medical education, Dr. Williams was not one a whit less eager that the public should share in the knowledge of all that pertains to the prevention of disease and the promotion of physical and mental well-being. When he became the director of the academy, and even while he was busy with the thousand and one details involved in the planning and construction of this building and in the reorganization of the academy's administrative and other functions, he found time and energy to plan and to agitate for the extension of the Academy's service to the lay public. I say agitate advisedly, for not everyone shared his conviction on that score, and some were strongly opposed. But in time his judgment prevailed, and years have shown how well he planned and how clear was his vision. Lindsay Williams fostered the laity lectures with enthusiasm, and I believe he would have warmly approved of this year's series. We wish again to welcome Mrs. Williams to this lecture tonight. Now it is my privilege to introduce the chairman of the evening, Dr. Theodore Shedlovsky, a scientist, expert in physical chemistry, an associate member of the Rockefeller Institute. He is both a good and an intimate friend of the speaker of this evening, Dr. Weiner, and hence preeminently fitted to serve as chairman. It gives me pleasure to introduce Dr. Shedlovsky. Thank you, Dr. Kyes. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce the speaker to you, because that is so easy. I doubt that there is a person in the audience who does not know of Dr. Wiener as the author of cybernetics, as an eminent mathematician. And so perhaps it would be more appropriate to introduce the audience to Dr. Wiener. I think I can assure our speaker that many in the audience know that Dr. Wiener has made very important contributions in the field of mathematics, in Fourier analysis, Fourier transform, in logic, in various branches of mathematics. Not so many in the audience, I believe, are aware of the fact that in a certain sense, Professor Wiener does not have exactly a formal degree in mathematics. His doctorate was really in philosophy. He is a product of the academic scene. He was, I believe, born on campuses he got his bachelor's degree at Tufts, his doctorate at Harvard. He studied in Cambridge, England, Göttingen, Columbia, Cornell. These are not given chronologically. He has taught at the University of Maine in Providence at Brown, at Tsinghao University in China, and has been 
in the mathematics department for some over 30 years at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Dr. Wiener is a man of many gifts. And uh, I think that it would be presumption to enumerate any of them. However, I want to make sure that he realizes that in this so-called lay audience, there are many people, I am certain, who have heard about his cybernetics second or third hand, and have heard that it has something to do with electronics, with machines, with human beings, and that there is something there of drawing a parallel and almost an identity between man and the machine. Dr. Wiener, I hope, knows that there are some in this audience who consider it an insult to make that a sort of comparison, an insult to man. There are others, Dr. Wiener, I'm sure, who considered an insult to the machine. <laughs> now, we are the lady, and New Yorkers, most of us, and many of us recall, as I do, a cartoon in a magazine called New Yorker by... Can you step up close? There's a second gallery. They can't hear you in the second gallery. A magazine called The New Yorker carried some years ago a cartoon by Charles Adams. This cartoon depicted a scene in a factory in which figures who looked like steel armor robots were busy with wrenches, screwdrivers, and other equipment in making others like them. There were two human figures in this cartoon, one apparently the owner of the factory or the chief executive and a visitor. And the owner was saying, yes, you know, I often wonder what all this is going to lead to. I tell this story because I hope that in his discourse tonight, our speaker may perhaps touch on some of the implications of this cartoon. Now, Dr. Wiener, as main members of the lady, I would ask you to give us guidance, divine or otherwise, in connection with at least some of the problems suggested by your title of men, machines, and the world about. Dr. Wiener. I, in the first place, now feel the high point of the evening has been reached, and I shall, shall now take care of its gradual decline. In the first place, I'm going to start historically of, with the various things that got me interested in these problems, because they are relevant to the various things I shall have to say about the present status of the problem. There were two converging streams of ideas that brought me into cybernetics. One of them was the fact that in the last war, when it was manifestly coming, but before uh, Pearl Harbor at any rate, when we were not yet in the conflict, I tried to see if I could find some niche in the war effort at that time. In that uh, particular problem, I looked for something to do and found it in connection with automatic computing machines. Automatic computing machines are what is called an analogy sort in which physical quantities are measured and not numbers counted, 
had already been made very successfully by Professor Vannevar Bush. But there were certain gaps in the theory. One of the gaps I can express mathematically by saying that these machines could do ordinary differential equations, but not partial differential equations. I shall express it physically by the fact that these machines could work in one dimension, namely time, but not in any very efficient way in two dimensions, or three. Now, it occurred to me that A, the use of television, had shown us a way to represent two or more dimensions on one, and B, that the previous devices which measured quantities should be replaced by a more precise sort of device that counted quantities. These were not only my own ideas, but at any rate, they were ideas that I had then, and I communicated them in a memorandum to Vannevar Bush, who was then in charge of scientific war planning for the entire country. The report that I gave was, in many ways, not in all, a substantial account of the present situation with automatic computing machines so that I had already become familiar with the idea of the machine which does its arithmetic by making choices on the basis of previous choices, on the basis of previous choices, and so on, according to a schedule furnished to the machine by punch tape or by magnetized tape or other methods of the sort. Now, the other thing that led me to this work was the problem that I actually got put into in war work. It turned out that at that time, Professor Bush did not feel that this contribution was immediate enough to have been effective in the last war. So I looked around for another thing, and the great question that was being discussed at that time was anti-aircraft defense. It was the time of the Battle of England, and the, the existence of the United States as a combatant country, the survival of anybody to combat with Germany, seemed to depend on anti-aircraft defense. Now, the anti-aircraft gun is a very interesting type of instrument. In the First World War, the anti-aircraft gun had been developed as a firing instrument, but one still used range tables directly by hand for firing the gun. That meant, essentially, that one had to do all the computation while the plane was flying overhead. And naturally, by the time you got in a position to do something about it, the plane had already done something about it and wasn't there. It became evident, and this long before the work that I did, uh, by the end of the First World War, and certainly in the period between the two, that the essence of the problem was to do all the computation in advance and embody it in instruments which could pick up the observations of the plane and fuse them in a proper way to get the necessary result to aim the uh, gun and aim it not at the plane, but sufficiently ahead of the plane so that the shell and the plane would arrive at the same time as induction. Well, that led to some very interesting mathematical theories. I had some ideas that turned out to be useful there. And I was put to work with a friend of mine, Julian Biglow. And very soon we ran into the following problem. The plane, uh, the, the anti-aircraft gun, is not an isolated instrument. While it can be fired by radar, the primitive and obvious method of firing it is to have a gun pointer. Now, this gun pointer is a human element. This human element is joined with the mechanical elements of your predictor. The actual fire control is a system involving human beings and machines 
at the same time and must be reduced from an engineering point of view to a single structure, which either means a human interpretation of the machine or a mechanical interpretation of the operator or both. Now, we were forced then, both for the man firing the gun and for the aviator himself, to replace them in our studies by appropriate machines. The question came, how would we make a machine to simulate a gun pointer? And what troubles would one expect with such a machine? Now, there is a certain sort of control apparatus that is used for controlling speed in the governance of steam engines, that is used for controlling direction in the ship steering apparatus, which is called a negative feedback apparatus. In the ship steering apparatus, the quartermaster who turns the wheel does not move the rudder directly. The rudder is much too heavy in a modern ship for a dozen quartermasters to move directly. What he does is move an element in the steering engine house, which is connected with the tiller of the ship by another element. The difference between the two positions is then conveyed to the steering engines on the two sides of the ship to regulate the admission of steam in the port or the starboard steering engine. The steering engine moves the rudder head, the tiller, in such a way as to cancel this uh, interval that has been placed between this moving element and the rudder head. And in doing that, it recloses the valves and moves the rudder of the ship. In other words, the rudder is, rep is moved by something representing the difference between the commanded position and the actual position of the rudder. That is called negative feedback. This negative feedback, however, has its diseases. There's a definite pathology to it, which was already discussed you will be rather astonished at the date, in 1868 by the great physicist Clark Maxwell in a paper of the Proceedings of the Royal Society on Governors. If the feedback of the rudder or the governor is too intense, the apparatus will shoot past the neutral position a little more than it originally was passed on one side, will shoot still further past on the other and will go into a hunting. Now, since we thought that the simplest way we could explain human control was by a feedback, we wondered whether this disease occurred. We went to our friend, Dr. Arturo Rosenblut, who was then Cannon's right-hand man at Harvard and in the Harvard Medical School, the physiologist, with the following question. Is there any nervous disease known in which a person trying to accomplish a task starts swinging wider and wider and is unable to finish it? If, for example, I reach for my cigar, I suppose that the, ordinarily, the ordinary way I control my action is in such a way as to reduce the amount by which the cigar has not been picked up. If the feedback is excessive, I would expect to go into a swing of that sort. Is that disease known? The answer was, most definitely that disease is known. It has exactly the symptoms named. It occurs in uh, the pathology of the cerebellum, the little brain. It's known as purpose tremor or cerebellar tremor. Well, that gave us the lead. It looked as if a common theory could be given to account for the pattern of human behavior and control machine behavior in this case, and that it depended on negative feedback. That was one of the leads that we had, 
the other lead went back to the study of the automatic control machinery, the automatic computing machinery. In the first place, automatic computing machinery is of no value except for one thing, its speed. It's more expensive than the ordinary desk machines, enormously more. You don't get anything out of it unless you use it at high speed. But to use a machine at high speed, it is necessary to see that every operation one carries out is carried out at a corresponding speed. If you mix in slow stages with fast stages in the machine, the slow stages always win out. They more nearly govern the behavior of the machine than the fast stages. Therefore, the commands given to a high-speed computing machine cannot be given while the machine is running by hand. They must be built in in advance to what is called a taping, like punch cards, like punch tape, like magnetic tape and the like. And your machine must not only control the numbers in their combination, but the scheduling of operations. Your machine must be a logical machine. There again, we found a great similarity to what a human being was doing. The human nervous system, it is perfectly true, does not exhaust all of human control activity. There is without any doubt a control activity in man that goes through hormones, that goes through the blood, and so on. But as far as the nervous system works, the individual fibers come very near to showing an all or none action. That is, they fire or they do not fire. They don't fire halfway. If your individual fibers leading to a given fiber are connected with it by what is known as synapses fire, in the proper combination, perhaps at least as many as a certain number, and if certain so-called inhibitory fibers do not fire, the outgoing fiber fires, otherwise not. Now this is an operation of consecutive switching, extremely like the consecutive switching of the automatic computing machine. And this led us to another comparison between the nervous system and the computing machine and led us furthermore to the idea that since the nervous system is not only a computing machine, but a control machine, that we may make very general control machines working on the successive switching basis and much more like the uh, control machine part the scheduling part of a computing machine than we might otherwise have thought possible. In particular, it seemed to us a very hopeful thing to make an automatic feedback control apparatus in which the feedback itself was carried out in large measure by successive switching operations such as one finds either in the nervous system or in the computing machine. It was the fusion of these two ideas, each of which has a human or animal side and has a mechanical side, which led to cybernetics. That book I wrote in response to a request from a French publisher, and I chose the name because I felt that this particular combination of ideas couldn't be left too long, an unbaptized orphan, from the Greek word kubernetes, meaning steersman, as essentially the art of the steersman. Now, from here on, I can go ahead in very many ways. The first thing that I want to say is that feedback mechanisms 
are well known to occur not only in the voluntary action of the human body, but are necessary as necessity for its very life. A few years ago, Professor Henderson of Harvard wrote a book entitled The Fitness of the Environment. Anybody who has read that book must regard it as very much of a miracle that any organism can live, and particularly a human organism. Man cannot exist over any variety of temperatures. For that matter, there is no active life, certainly above the boiling point and below the freezing point, and most planets probably don't have temperatures lying in that convenient range. When I say boiling point and freezing point, I mean of water, because water is a very uh, distinct and special sort of chemical substance. Now, even a fish can't exist at boiling point as alive. It can exist from something like our own temperature to something around freezing point, perhaps a little below, but not much below. And we can't do anything like that. We either have a chill or a fever if we get near it. And the temperature within which life is possible does not vary for any extended period for man, certainly much over 10 degrees, and practically varies much less than that. Again, we must live under constant conditions of saltiness of our blood, of urea concentration in our blood, and so on. How do we do this? The idea goes back to Claire Bernard and was developed very much by Canon. We are full of what are called homeostatic mechanisms, which are mechanisms like thermostats. A homeostat is a mechanism which keeps certain bodily conditions within a narrow range. One of those homeostats, probably at least in part located in the medulla, regulates temperature. Another one regulates breathing rates. Another one of them regulates urea concentration. It's the apparatus of the kidneys. And there are not only a few, but many, many such controls. Now, such a control is like the house thermostat. The house thermostat, if you remember it, is a piece of apparatus which has a little thermometer in it made of two pieces of metal. It makes a contact at one temperature and breaks it at others, and it regulates the admission of oil to the furnace and the ignition of that oil. The interesting thing is it has its own pathology. Many of you people must know that. We have a house in which there is a thermostat with some brilliant architect placed in the only room in the house with a fireplace. The result is that if we want to cool the house in winter, we light the fire. Because we give false information to the thermostat that the house is warm and the thermostat turns out the furnace fire. Well, I may point out that a similar phenomenon in the uh, human thermostat might, call chill, might cause chills or might cause fever. I'm going to depart a little bit from the main object of talk because this thing is medically very interesting. It, there are certain diseases, I'm not going to go into a characterization because I am not going to commit myself before so many doctors, in which the production of certain substances, say cells, the density of certain cells in the blood, as in leukemia, is increasing steadily. However, this steady increase is rather a regular thing in the disease. 
the actual rate of production and destruction of the cells is much, much higher than the rate of increase of them. Now, that might be due, conceivably, to an independent disease of production or of destruction, but I don't think so. Because if these two phenomena give you big quantities that are nearly the same, a relatively small change in one will throw their difference out badly and produce a great irregularity in the difference. That's what would happen if we had no homeostat. I don't think that's what happens. I think that the regularity of the process is an indication that we have a homeostat which is working, but working at the wrong level, as if the spring of the house thermostat were changing. That is an idea which is entirely tentative, but may have serious consequences for medicine. Now, there is another side to this that is also interesting. The homeostats in the body that I've spoken of are built in to the human body. Can we make a homeostat that is partly in the body and partly outside? The answer is definitely yes. A Dr. Bickford at the Mayo Clinic, and he's been followed in this by Dr. Versiano in the uh, uh, Cushing Veterans Hospital in Framingham, has made an apparatus which takes the brain waves of the electroencephalogram, amplifies them up, and uses the total number that has passed for standard time, or that has passed, to inject anesthetic, either into the veins or into a mask. The procedure is this. As the patient goes under, the brain waves become less active, the injection becomes less, and less injection is actually needed to keep the level of anesthesia. In this way, anesthesia can be kept at a reasonably constant level for hours. Here you have a homeostat, which is a manufactured one. I don't believe that this is the last example in medicine. I think that the administration of drugs by homeostats, which read directly their physiological consequences, is a field which has a great future. However, I say this tentatively. Now, so far, I have been talking about man. Let's go to the machine, on the other hand. Where will we find a case where a homeostatic machine is particularly desirable? The chemical industry is a very interesting case. A chemical factory is generally full of pipes carrying acids or alkalis or explosives or, at any rate, dangerous substances to work with. When certain thermometers reach certain temperatures and when certain polarimeters give certain readings and certain pressures have been reached and so on, somebody turns certain valves. He'd better turn the right valves, particularly if it's something like an oil cracking plant or an atomic uh, chemical factory dealing with radioactive materials. But if he has to turn valves on the basis of the readings, then we can, as in the anti-aircraft gun, build in in advance the combinations which should turn valves to distinguish them from those that don't. And the valves can be turned through amplifiers, through what is essentially computing apparatus, by the reading of the instruments themselves. The instruments are sense organs. Now you may say, very good, but you have to have a man to provide for the emergency turning off. By the way, it's extremely desirable not to have people in a factory that's likely to explode any time. Uh, people are expensive to replace, and besides, we have certain elementary humanitarian instincts. But the answer is, is a man likely to give better regulation in emergency than an instrument? The answer is no. For this reason, 
any emergency that you can reasonably think, reasonably think of, you can provide for in your computing and control apparatus. If at the time of the emergency, you can't think of what to do, uh, and before the time, you cannot think of what to do, during the emergency, you're almost certain to make a wrong decision. If you cannot figure out a reasonable course of conduct in advance, you simply do not find that the Lord will give you the right thing to do when the emergency comes. Emergencies are provided for in times of peace, and I mean also by that emergencies like the falling of an atomic bomb, about which I may or may not have something to say later. Now, then, for perfectly legitimate and even humanitarian reasons, the automatic control system is coming in in chemical industries and other especially dangerous industries. However, the same techniques that make that possible makes the automatic assembly line possible for automobiles. The automatic assembly line possible perhaps even in the textile industries. And I can think of dozens of other industries. The interesting point here is this, that while the succession of orders that you give can be almost infinitely varied in a machine, the instruments which give successive orders are practically standard no matter what you're doing. There are two variants. One is the quasi-human hands to which they lead, and the other is the sequence of orders put in. Now, to change from one, say, make of car to the other, to change from one style of body to the other in an automobile assembly line, you would not measure the order-giving machinery, you would measure the particular taping, you would alter the particular taping of that machinery. There's a very interesting thing here. I suppose that a good many of you have seen the movie Cheaper by the Dozen. And in that movie, what I conceive to be the main leading idea of the Galbraiths is completely missed, as it would be in most movies. The Galbraiths had the idea that man was not working anywhere like full efficiency in his ordinary operations. They thought that families of a dozen were not had by people simply because of the stupidity of people in running their daily tasks, which could be avoided by a better ordering of those tasks. That was the motive behind the large family. That was the motive behind the systematic bringing up of those children. Now, however, when you have simplified a task by reducing it to a routine of consecutive processes, you have done the same sort of thing that you need to do to put the task on a machine and run the process by a completely automatic machine. The problem of industrial management and, uh, and ordering which was handled by Taylor, by the Galbraiths and so on, is almost the same problem as that of the taping of a control machine. So that instead of actually improving the conditions of the worker, it has telescoped the work worker out of the picture. That is a very important thing because it is a process that is taking place now. I want to say that we are, we are facing a new industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution represented the replacement of the energy of man and of animals and the power by the energy and power of the machine. The steam engine was its symbol. Well, that has gone so far that there's nothing that a man with pick and shovel can do but glean after a bulldozer. There is no rate at which pure pick and shovel work can be paid in this country, which 
will guarantee the man doing it a living. It is simply economically impossible to compete with the bulldozer for bulldozer work. The new industrial revolution, which is taking place now, consists primarily in replacing human judgment and discrimination at low levels by the discrimination of the machine. The machine appears now not as a source of power, but as a source of control and a source of communication. We communicate with the machine, and the machine communicates with us. The machines communicate with one another. Energy is, and power are not the proper terms to measure them. Well, if we, in the small way, make human tasks easier by replacing them with a machine execution of the tasks, and in a large way, eliminate the human element in these human tasks, we may find that we have essentially burnt incense before the machine god. There's a very real danger in this country in bowing down before the brazen car. The idol is the gadget. And I know very great engineers who never think further than the construction of the gadget and never think of the question of the integration between the gadget and human beings in society. If we allow things to a reasonably slow development, then the introduction of the gadget, as it comes in, may hurt us enough to provoke a salutary response so that we realize that we cannot worship the gadget and sacrifice the human being to it. But a situation is easily possible in which we may have a disastrous result. Let us suppose that we go tomorrow to war with Russia. Now, I think that Korea, if it has shown us anything, has shown us that modern war means nothing without infantry. The problem of occupying Korea is serious enough. The problem of occupying China and Russia staggers imagination. But we, have to, we shall have to prepare to do that if we do go to war, at the same time as we have to keep up an industrial production to feed the army, second, I mean feed it with munitions as well as ordinary food and ordinary equipment, second to none in history. We shall have to do a maximum production job with a labor market simply scraped to the bottom. And that means the automatic machine. A war of that sort will mean the machines will mean putting a large part of our best engineering ability in developing the machines within two months, probably. Now, it happens that the people who do this sort of a job are there. They're the people who have been trained in electronic work in the last war, who worked with radar. We're further on with the automatic machine than we were with radar at the beginning, at, our, at Pearl Harbor. Therefore, the situation is that probably two to three years will see the automatic factory well understood and beginning to be itself in production and that five years or so would see it something of which we possess the complete know-how and of which we possess a vast backlog of parts. Also, in war, social reforms do not get made. At the end of such a war, we'll find ourselves then with a tremendous backlog of parts and know-how, which is extremely tempting to anybody who wants to make a quickie fortune and get out from under and leave the rest of the community to pick up the pieces. That may very well happen. If that does happen, heaven help us, because we'll have an unemployment compared with which the Great Depression was a nice little joke.
Well, you see the picture drawing together. Now, I suppose one of the things that you people would like will be consolation. Gentlemen, there is no Santa Claus. If we want to live with the machine, we must understand the machine. We must not worship the machine. We must make a great many changes in the way we live with other people. Other people. We must revalue leisure. We must turn the great administrators of business, of industry, of politics into a state of mind where they will consider that the leisure of people is their business and is not none of their business. We shall have to do this unhampered by slogans which fit a previous state of society and don't fit the present. We shall have to do this unhampered by the creeping paralysis of secrecy which is engulfing our government. Because secrecy simply means that we are unable to face situations as they are. The people who have to control situations are in no position to handle them. We shall have to realize that while we may make the machines our gods and sacrifice men to machines, we do not have to do so. And if we do so, we deserve the punishment of idolaters. It's going to be a difficult time. If we can live through it and keep our head, and if we do not get annihilated by war itself and our other problems, there is a great chance of turning the machine to human advantage. But the machine itself has no particular favor for humanity. It is possible to make two kinds of machines. I will not go into the detail. The machines whose taping is determined once for all and the machines whose taping is continually being modified by their experience. The second sort of machines can, in some sense, learn. Now, gentlemen, the moral problem of the machine does, differs in no way from the old moral problem of magic. The fact that the machines follow laws of nature and magic was supposed to be outside of nature is not even an interesting moral issue. Sorcery was condemned in the Middle Ages. The modern, a certain modern type of gadgeteer would have been hanged or burnt as a sorcerer under the ethics of the Middle Ages. And the interesting thing is that the Middle Ages, to a certain extent, I don't mean in the, its favor for the flame, but in its disfavor for the gadgeteer, has a point of being right. Namely, sorcery was not the supernatural, the use of the supernatural. It was the use of human power for other purposes than the greater glory of God. Now, I am not a theist when I say the greater glory of God. I mean it for some end to which we can give a justified moral value. I say that the medieval attitude is the attitude of the fairy tale in many things. But the attitude of the fairy tale is very wise in many things that are relevant to modern life. If you have the machine which grants you your wish, then you must pay attention to the old fairy tale of the three wishes, which tells you that if you do make a wish which is likely to be granted, you'd better be very sure that it is what you want and not what you think you want. If you know the story of the monkey's paw, Jacob's story, the, uh, a talisman grants a couple three wishes. The first is for 200 pounds. Immediately the man appears from the factory to say that their boy has been crushed in the machinery. 
And although the factory recognizes no responsibility, they will give a solace of 200 pounds. Then the next wish is that they wish the boy back again and his ghost appears. Then they wish the ghost away, and that finishes that story. That is common in folklore, and it is quite as significant with regard to the machine as it is with regard to any other magic. The other thing is that the machine that can learn is essentially a genie. And you all know the story of the fisherman and the bottle. He opens the bottle and the gin appears, the genie appears, and tells him that it, uh, it has decided to kill the man that opened the bottle. The fisherman talks the genie back into the bottle. Gentlemen, when we get into trouble with the machine, we cannot talk the machine back into the bottle. You will be given an opportunity to ask questions of Dr. Weiner, and I think there will be ushers with um, some paper uh, pass about you. You have been listening to the Lindsley R. Williams Memorial Lecture, the first in this new series of lectures to the laity which has been delivered by Dr. Norbert Wiener. The subject of Dr. Wiener's talk was men, machines, and the world about. Unfortunately, the city station does not have the time to take this question and answer period. The next of these lectures to the laity will be broadcast by WNYC-FM on Wednesday, November 15th at this same time. The speaker, Dr. Hans Selye, will talk on the Renaissance in endocrinology. The lectures to the laity are brought to you by WNYC-FM, direct from the New York Academy of Medicine, as a public service feature. Following station identification, we join the facilities of WNYC-AM, now broadcasting the proceedings of the 1950 Herald Tribune Forum. This is WNYC-FM, the high-fidelity voice of New York City.